gonna hit that before I forget like I did earlier. Um, Chief Wright is, he's a special person to me because, you know, when I did, when I started Base Honor Guard, that was the first time I gotten out of my comfort zone to that level. The first time I felt purpose and I started really understanding what what I was good at and what I was bad at and, and my strengths and just really coming into myself as a leader, you know? And I felt like I could do anything at this point, right? And so when I went to AFA uh, as a 12 OAY nominee for the Air Force level, I was invited to go. That's how I know Philip McAlpin. Yeah, yeah. He was in my global strike group and he was the one picked to be a 12 OAY. Uh, that's why I love that dude so much. Shout out to Chief McAlpin. Yep, good people. Yes, CE. <laughs> Dirt um, boy too. Dirt boy. Yeah, the best of the best. Airborne Dirt boy. You know it. Yeah, and he like knows how to like make runways and stuff. Like I heard his story as well. Yeah. I need to get him on here. Actually, I did invite him on here. He'll be on here one day. I'll, I'll send him a text telling him he must do it for the people. One hundred percent. Yeah, this is for everybody else. But my point is, we saw Chief Wright at AFA, and I was like, I'm gonna invite him to Honor Guard, <laughs> and everyone's like, Bro, no, don't. Like, that's ridiculous. Don't go up to him and talk about and telling him to come to T Honor Guard. I was like, I don't know why, but I feel like it will work. I felt like it would work. Yeah. And so I walked up to him. I I hit it off with him, and then I pitched it to him. And three months later, he was in our honor car. You know what's funny is like uh, when people are like, oh, don't say that. Don't approach them. Whatever, like different levels of positions of people in leadership. It's always funny. Like when you approach them, they're, 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 that's no problem at all. You know, I guess it depends on how you present yourself and what you actually bring up. But, but for the most part, by position, they would hope you would approach them. Like yeah. you want the opposite. You don't want people thinking there's all these barriers and, and policies that prevent you from talking to you. Like... You're literally there to be talked to. Yep. Yeah. You know what I mean? You want to be asked for help, right? Yeah. Like that's why you stayed in this long. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like a lot of like younger folks don't know that. We don't realize that. Yeah. I didn't realize that for a long time. I thought I was like not allowed, you know. It wasn't until I got a little bit higher rank when I was friends with chiefs and then I knew, okay, this is not what I thought at all. So I always try to preach you know, that they want to be asked for yeah, help. The culture changed too a little bit over the time frame when you came in as an airman to, yeah. to being a senior NCO. Uh, you know, it's a few years, right? Uh, the Air Force, I've been in 21 and the Air Force has changed. 18 for me. Significantly, right? Over the time of my time being in. So I think it's uh, people are a little more accessible now. Uh, things like what we're doing right now, it makes us more accessible as well. Um, but Chief Wright was the first one in my recollection that was the chief master in the Air Force that was as accessible as he was. Uh, you know, and then since South Bass, the same way, right? But uh, that's the first time technology allowed us to do that. So just, you know, cultural shift, generational shifts as well, you know, so. But anyway, I'm glad you invited him out. Yeah, and, and honestly, just to tell you that story real quick, because it is a good story. I had a plan A and a plan B. I had the whole thing, because I'm honor guard. I map plans out. Right, yeah. I, I was hardwired to map plans out. It, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And so I had it all planned out. And I thought, he might not like that. Like, what if I give him this tour and he's seen it a million times? What if he's bored? Like, I need a plan B. So my plan B was, if he didn't like the tour, I had three airmen's testimonials ready to go on why they joined Honor Guard, what it meant to them. Plan A failed horribly. It was my worst nightmare. There I had <laughs> there I had Chief right there. My wife's even here. She wants to see this. Yeah. She's there. I got Chief right there. I got Chief Pinheiro there. Diamond One. The OG Diamond One. And he was bored. I thought he was going to fall asleep. <laughs> I think he did fall asleep. I think I saw him like, you know, just the eyes kind of like did that thing, you know, and I thought... I thought, oh my goodness, I am blowing this. <laughs> I was like, Josh, get it together. And no matter how exciting I talked or how fast I moved my hands. <laughs> you take flight. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worked. Yeah. And I said, we got to hit. I said, execute plan B. I said, get the airman in that room. Now, plan B. We're, we're dropping plan A. They're like, are you sure, sir? I said, I'm sure. Plan B, now! 
And Chief Wright's like, what's up? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we get him into plan B. We got, by the way, I had FSS print off murals. I printed off all the professional photos of us, and I had them all over the place. They looked beautiful. They faded away in like two weeks and looked terrible, and they started falling off the walls. <laughs> but for that moment... That's it, not a knock on FSS, though. It's not. It's, a, <laughs> it's my poor planning. Uh, but at any rate, when he talked to those airmen, changed everything. When he heard those stories, he had a huge smile on his face. He felt like he was at home, and that's what we rolled with for the rest of the tour. That's it was awesome. just him talking to the airmen and hearing their stories. And, and then he started sharing his own stories. The group just kind of naturally came around him and Chief Pinheiro, and they talked about how they were honor guardsmen. And, and he was telling stories I've never heard before, and I've watched a lot of his stuff. Yeah. But a lot of their – that was his all-in moment was based honor guard. And so, like, I, when I say magical moment, I was like – Oh my goodness, this is this is incredible. Like yeah. he's bonding with my team and I invited all past honor guardsmen. There's like 50 people in this room. And and then at the end we got him in on our chant where we say like we yell honor guard and then that we yell sharp crisp and motionless and it was just hype. I mean, it was he he was late to his next stop. You know, they're at the white van out front like <laughs> tapping their foot looking at their watch. Yeah. And I was like, I don't even care if you're late. We can be late. We're having a good time. And I shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> so like, he's going to be late. They're talking to their wrists and stuff. Yeah. And I opened it. I said, he's going to be real late. And I shut the door again. <laughs> um, that I hope, last I hope part, you didn't take him from other airmen. That would be awful. <laughs> okay. So that last part was a joke. <laughs> I, that was, that was a joke. That was oh, me being funny. Got you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to Chief Katie McCool. I'm assuming you know who that is. I do. Uh, she's o OG 12 OAY. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, recruiter, command chief. Um, her husband's a chief. He's awesome. Yeah. But she really helped put that together. I, I told her that I talked to Chief Wright. He said he'd come see us. And then she made it happen. I'm not going to act like I made it happen. <laughs> I didn't. She made it happen. You were the visionary. I was a visionary, <laughs> but in reality, I pr it probably wasn't going to work, <laughs> right? Because it ain't even up to him. Like, he's not writing the schedule. Yeah. So, so Chief McCool, she honestly is the one that made it happen. And, and then, like, as, as they walked out, she, like, gave me that fist bump, like, y'all killed it, you know, kind of fist bump. Yeah. And I was like, yes! What, where was she at then? Command Chief of Whiteman. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So Good that's time. the story. I know this is your episode. It's cool, man. But obviously, you need to get that off your chest. I needed to tell <laughs> someone that, and I'm having real talk, real talk with Caleb. That's what, I, what. That's the title of this video. Oh, real is it? It is. Real talk with Caleb. Hey, let's do it. So I was giving you real we've, talk. We've been doing it. Yeah, this is a crossover. I'm gonna give you this episode. Sweet. You could post it. It's a crossover. <laughs> you have to explain to me what that means later. I don't. I don't know. What it just that means is. we both use it. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> for the cost of one, you get two. It's like an infomercial. <laughs> it, it is. It is. Well, we thanks for inviting me on, man. It's, yeah. it's good. I it's good to see you in person. Oh, my God. It's great to see you in person. Um, like I said, you're much taller than I thought. You're freaking yeah. alpha. <laughs> God. <laughs> you're just built different. I'm just, just – I'm a big you, dude. You need you to know? stay out of that uh, gym. That's not fair. That's an unfair advantage. You should never, <laughs> ever be able to touch a weight. No, that's my sons. They're a lot stronger than I am. Yes, and they're airmen too, right? At least one of them one is. One of them is, yeah. No, my oldest one, he's a defender, uh, stationed out of Ellsworth. Super proud of proud of all my boys, but proud of him from a military standpoint, of course. So. Is it weird that he's in the Air Force? Or no, is not it, at all. I love yeah, it. I just can't wrap my head around like me thinking of, well, because my son is three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want him in the Air Force. I mean, he can come and watch and learn and right. all that, but no, I'm not ready to tilt them for yet. Right. <laughs> But, like, I just feel like that would be so proud. Like, he started in your family. Now he's kind of joined another family. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So there's, yeah. like, two different families going on for your son. Yeah, it's a, it's a different bond, you know. Um, I mean, I have a good relationship with all my sons. Uh, my oldest son, obviously, is the first. Uh, so he learned how to be a – I tell him a lot of times, uh, he learned how to be a kid while I was learning how to be a dad because uh, I was just really, really young when we had him. 
Uh, you know a little bit about my story. I didn't have the greatest example. Uh, right. I actually had a horrible example of, of what a dad should be. Mm -hmm. um, I had, the, I guess, a great example of what not to do. But anyway, right. uh, so we already had a special bond, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when he joined the military, anything military related, of course, he comes to me now for, which is great. I love that. You know, I love being his dad and, and with the experience of Chief Mass Sergeant. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, it's, it's still bro and bra and everything else, right? There's, I don't know, some people maybe do it differently, but me and my son, we, uh, unless we were, when we were in military or in uniform, uh, we were stationed at the same base for a little bit at Ellsworth. That's why. Obviously, I wouldn't do it with him in public and with his peers because that's not a good, uh, you know, uh, image or perspective or perception for them. Right. Um, but there was one time at the gate, man. Uh, he's a defender, so he's checking ID out the gate, maintaining security. And uh, so I pulled through and I chat with him, you know, often. And uh, so anyway, I fist bumped him when I got done talking. I was like, uh, you know, all right, bro, I love you. See you at the house later. And so there was another defender in the in the ECP checkpoint there. And he's like, uh, later, he's like, that dude's weird. And uh, Elijah's like, uh, why, why is he weird? He's like, that chief said he loves you. <laughs> and so Elijah's like, yeah, I know that dude is weird. And he didn't tell him that I was his dad. And I came back later to visit oh with him. Oh, my gosh. And he's gosh. like, the other young airman's putting the pieces together. He's looking at the name tape on me and the name tape on Elijah. And he's like, wait a minute. You fooled me. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, was oh like, I love my. you too, bro. It's all right. <laughs> he said, that dude's weird. Yeah, that dude's weird, man. He's, it's a chief that loves Aaron. That's crazy. We don't see that anywhere. <laughs> right. Oh. oh, I love that. Um, and I love Real Talk with Kayla. Yep. Yeah, I love that you're a chief that's a podcaster. And you were, you're, you're my kind of chief. I'm not going to be a chief. If I was, I'd hope to be like you, though. Oh, man, I thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, I, and I honest, honest to God being that. And I say that because just like I gave you a shout out the other day, because I was once again upset from something. Yeah. Uh, I was triggered. Yeah. You don't want to see Josh White triggered. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Everything stayed on the ground, right? You didn't throw anything, did you? I didn't throw anything. But like the what you said, like I, I revisited, you know, what you sent me yeah. when, when something else, uh, another piece of bad news I received uh, that was frustrating to hear. I revisited the letter and the coin that you sent me, and it's that extra mile, that extra special touch that's not common. You know, there's a lot, it's, it's really easy to be like nice and friendly yeah. and say nice things. I mean, anyone can do that. But to like do what you did, recognize I was going through a hard time and then send me something so special like your personal coin, a handwritten letter. I don't think I've ha ever received a handwritten letter in years. Wow, yeah. I mean, that's just not, that's kind of faded away in, in, in today's techno, you know, technological world, but it felt more personal seeing your handwriting, knowing you wrote that. Yeah. Um, and so I revisited that when I got more bad news and it helped get me through it, knowing that there's someone like you out there who does have my back. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. But that extra 10% is what sets you apart, in my opinion, and makes you a no kidding, awesome leader who talks the talk and walks the walk. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I have to uh, be honest, that's uh, not, it wasn't natural for me to be that way. Um, you know, just from my background, I came from being, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a survivor of sorts, you know, looking out for number one first, you know. Um, but I've learned that from my wife. You know, a lot of times people say, hey, if you need anything, just just let us know, you know, and we'll, we'll be there. Nobody ever reaches out, really. Not, I shouldn't say nobody, that's the absolute. Very few people reach out and say, hey, can you help me? And my wife took on this mantra a few years back uh, of just go and do something versus asking somebody if they needed something. And if it wasn't exactly what they needed, it's still the thought, you know, people say the thought that counts, a thought mm -hmm. on Facebook post or a Facebook messenger uh, versus a thought of you actually showing up to try to do something for somebody. Uh, so I give a shout out to Amy on that one. She, I learned that one from her. Absolutely. Our spouses are freaking amazing. I mean, she puts up with me. So that's, that's enough in itself to say that she's a super right. woman. <laughs> Any spouse that is a military spouse has my utmost respect now that I've been through the whole journey because oh my goodness like you start here but you end up like way over here yeah. like you can't plan hardly anything you know like you just got to go with the flow and make the best of what you got yeah and we signed up for that they didn't and so and like even more so for like the folks who stay in like you who are a chief have to move all the time you guys didn't know you were going to be a chief when you got married? No. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? I wasn't in the military then. <laughs> right. So, like, she really didn't sign up for that. No. Like, she said, okay, you can be in the Air Force. Cool. Things may happen. 
But like now you're it's a different beast. Oh well, so we should like pause and go back a little bit just okay. in case Amy's listening to this. And uh, so it wasn't even quite that way. So okay. the person that sits in front of you today has learned a lot <laughs> over the years. I didn't tell my wife. We didn't talk about me joining the Air Force. What? Yeah. You didn't talk about no, it? No, no, not at all. Uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. So uh, the corporation I was working for was uh, going out of business, uh, Where how I grew up. Um, mm -hmm. I just felt like it was my role and my responsibility to take care of my family. So, you know, her and Elijah were, you know, my main objectives to keep them alive, provide food, shelter for them. And uh, so I went and uh, signed up for the Air Force without telling her because I only her to know Caleb's got it. Whatever it is, uh, financial, you know, whatever, I, I never have to worry about it. So I didn't want to come to her. And I've learned, right, over the years of having conversation and communication is key. But I didn't want her to be like, oh, he's bringing me a problem. I just went and solved the problem. So, yeah, that was uh, quite the shock in her grandmother's living room. I come home, you know, I was like, I did this great thing. So she was in this little rocking glider. And I, I leaned over by her ear and I said, hey, babe, I said, we're going to be airmen. And she's like, what? Oh my God. I was like, we're going to be airmen. And she's like, what does that mean? I said, I joined the Air Force. And she, she said another word I won't say on the podcast. And everybody in the living room just came to a halt. Everybody's oh, no. looking. And then when they realized what had happened, everybody was like clapping and stuff, you know. But still, at that moment, I realized, like, I probably should have discussed this with Amy, you know. Right. But I it's mean, worked out great. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i would say humble beginnings but they were dumb beginnings but no I, way. I know what you i that's yeah there i can't tell you how many times i've tried to do something nice for someone and it's i didn't quite think at all the angles and i call that like the zach morris moments like you remember in saved by the bell yeah like he he's always has good intentions but by the end of the episode it's always like ruined yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I didn't know the military planning uh, process at that point. Military decision making process. I didn't. I hadn't been trained on that to know what a COA was and the second, third order effects. I was just well. In, in life, the test comes first, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you had a C on that one. Oh, F maybe. I don't know. I mean, you're still here, right? So because she's got a lot of patience. <laughs> yeah, she she exercised grace. Yes, indeed, grace yeah. is a good word. I love that. You know, one of those things I was hoping to talk to you about why you're yeah. here, if you were comfortable with it, was being a father. Oh, absolutely. Man. I will say that I had everything I needed financially and I have a close relationship with my dad and you appreciated that. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Especially yeah. from your upbringing, you saw the connection I had with my dad, the discussion we had on my episode one and that meant a lot to me for yeah. you to say that. Um, but there was a lot of divorce. So I, I didn't have an issue with my parents directly, but they had s so many issues going on that they were out of pocket yeah. a lot uh, to the point where I would basically live at my friend's house. You know, yeah. uh, so like my friend's parents are like parents to me too. Uh, yeah. Like Jeff Bird and his parents, Scott Thompson across the street, his parents. I'd, I'd stay at, I didn't know why I was staying at their house. Yeah. Looking back and all the meals they provided me and the time they spent with me, I think they as parents knew and recognized, yeah. but I didn't really know. I was just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that trauma, my dad's on his third wife and her name's Kathy. She's my stepmom. She's incredible and they're doing great. And then my mom's on her third husband. They're still married. So they worked it out. It just, yeah. took, it just took a while. Um, and... I have that trauma from that 100%. I didn't know it at the time, but as life goes on, it started to reveal itself. It started to reveal itself when I got married and it started to reveal itself when I had children mm. because you're, fa you're, you're put in new and different situations. You yeah. don't know how you're going to respond to it, right? I thought I was good. I thought I, hadn't, I was problem free, Yeah. but things started coming up uh, within me and I could sense that there was generational trauma there. And I'm doing so, I'm trying so hard to not pass that on and to be present and to be a good dad. Yeah. You know what I mean? And to keep my marriage. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want them to go through that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and so that's what I wanted to first talk to you yeah, about. Absolutely. Because you've talked about, I wanted to hear a little bit about your upbringing, what those challenges were, and then how that impacts you as a father today. Uh, yeah. So, no, thanks for the question. Um, Growing up, uh, I think the easiest way to describe it, we don't have to get into details of it, um, 
you can, uh, you know, your imagination can fill in all the gaps, right? Uh, or your audience as well. Uh, very abusive, physically, uh, physically abusive um, for for me and my brothers and my sisters. Uh, a lot of psychological and emotional abuse. Right. Um, at the time when you're going through it, you don't realize that, right? You you know, like as a as a young person, anger will come up inside of you. Uh, some people have heard it described, depending on what kind of books you read and stuff, like a fire inside your stomach. Uh, I've actually felt that on quite a few occasions where like, you know, when you're a younger, smaller person and you want to do, uh, you know, basically fight uh, to stay alive because that's what you're thinking, right? I never was like uh, truly looking back and in, in jeopardy of losing my life uh, on a couple of occasions that argument could be made. Um, but at the time, you know, I'm just thinking I'm, you know, a little three, five, six, eight, 12 year old kid, you know, throughout the years. Of just trying to survive and feeling that anger and even when somebody says something to you or cuts you down or says hey uh you know uh, i think for the audience to understand this if they've never had this experience uh, imagine the person that you're supposed to be able to love the most the one that's going to take care of you from a father or mother figure a parental figure if you will uh you know uh, a guardian uh, you look into them for everything and uh they tell you that you're not going to amount to anything and that you shouldn't even know if it existed so those are things and, that and like, then you really, have nothing to compare it to. Yeah. So, you know, you at the time, you're just like, man, that, that really hurts. But you don't realize how deep that psychological or emotional scar really is. Uh, and you brought it up earlier. So I don't want to jump all over the place, but you brought it up earlier and saying, hey, now I'm, I'm kind of realizing this more and more as a grown person, right, as an adult. Uh, and I started realizing that uh, when I was about 18, 19 years old, because uh, at the time I was just like, oh, it just makes me tougher. And then I started, you know, realizing, uh, fast forward to, you know, uh, in and out of different places. Long story short, I ended up in uh, uh, meeting my wife. Uh, I was on my way to, to, to the Army. Uh, I was going to join the Army. I was going to MEPS on Saturday. I met her on Friday night, thank God, uh, for multiple reasons, not just to, to I think I'd have been a decent soldier as well, but um, it just turned my life around. And the reason I tell you that, not only for the great relationship I have with my wife, but her grandfather <clears throat> was the first adult male in my life that I looked up to, not at first, but eventually, and, and it's a key point. So going, going, we, you know, we meet, we get married, um, working for this cabinet company, decided to join the Air Force after we have Elijah. And I didn't know how to be a dad, but I knew one thing or a couple of things. For one, as a husband, I was going to treat my wife, I was going to treat Amy like a queen. And when you don't have any money, that's hard to do outside of emotion, right? Like physically buying stuff can't really happen uh, when you don't have much money, but you can definitely, I said, I'm always going to tell her she's beautiful no, no matter what happens. I'm always going to tell her that the food that she's making is always great, you know, because that's some other trauma. I saw my mom abuse a lot. I mean, her face put in a pie, a hot pie one time because the pie wasn't right and like scarred her face and stuff. So I, I always knew like on the other side of everything that you say has weight, everything you say has impact and will last, right? Because once the word's out of your mouth, it's, you can't get it back. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like if you start to throw a punch, you can stop it, right? Or you, whatever on the physical side, you can stop it. But once you let that word out of your mouth, it's gone. Uh, and that can cut down in psychological and emotional states, right? So anyway, um, I said, I know I'm going to treat her like a queen and I want to be the best dad that's ever walked the face of the earth. I didn't even know what that meant, right? But right. I knew Elijah. Uh, yeah, you was, didn't have the, the template. Nothing to compare it to. Except right? what not to do. What like not to said. do. Yeah. But that doesn't, so anybody that's listening, just because you have that mindset doesn't mean you're going to be a good father. It just means you're, you're not going to be a bad one on purpose, if that makes right. sense, right? I know I'm not yeah. going to physically abuse my son. Uh, in my case, it was a son. I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, abandon them and all these things. Uh, but then I uh, enter my wife's grandfather, uh, and he took time out to talk to me about what being a husband was about and what being a father was about. So like I said, the first adult male that ever took time and, and spent time with me. Uh, so things about like, uh, uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a man of faith as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So when your kids start getting older and start challenging you on uh, whether or not listening to you. And that could be, when I say older, just old enough to talk and walk. You know? Right. Um, and you start like, man, like how should I handle this? So me from a faith base as well, I'm like, well, I mess up all the time and God doesn't like smack me around. Right. So right. I knew physical corporal punishment. I'm not saying I'm against that for some families that works for them. Abuse, definitely not for it. Uh, but corporal punishment, you was never going to be in my wheelhouse. And you stated earlier, for those that are listening, don't really know, but I'm a rather large human being. Uh, and so I knew that even my dad was about 6'3", 220, so he wasn't small either. Uh, and when he would backhand you, like when I was smaller, I'd fly over a couch, like literally, like come off the ground. Um, yeah. So I knew like how much power, you know, a large human has versus a small human. So I knew corporal punishment was never going to be the thing. Um, that's why I was mentioned earlier about Elijah and me having such a bond. 
uh, because we were learning things together, right? Um, I never, obviously never, never even really raised my voice at him, uh, but trying to figure out how to father him and, and show him how to be a, a good citizen, be a good man. Uh, I didn't know how to do that to your point. I'm kind of getting taught myself at the same time. Um, but yeah, there's things that uh, the psychological scars you mentioned and emotional uh, trauma, you don't realize until we're humans that we're gonna make mistakes. And you'll say, uh, as an example, I'm disappointed in you versus I'm disappointed in the decision you made or the reason you made that decision. Two yeah. very, very similar. My wife taught me that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, yep. oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, you're no, good. I just, I, I think words are super powerful. I I argue to say they're the most powerful tool that we have because they can, they can make people love, they can make people fear, they can make war happen yeah. with just words. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, but my wife, she corrects me all the time because, you know, I'm like, you're being bad. And she'll say, hey, you got to stop saying that. Say that, that that was a bad decision. You're going to – because you become their internal dialogue. Yep. I'm bad. I'm bad. You, you know, you're filling their subconscious with that. And so I think that's such an amazing approach to point out the decision, not the person and who they are. Yeah, so something else to think, uh, keep in mind, not necessarily for you, if it applies, obviously, for anybody that's listening, not only is it that constant dialogue, uh, and I'm a product of this, like when I first got in the Air Force, I was going to prove to everybody uh, in my town and my family that just uh, credited me, you know, and, and all that stuff, I said, I'm going to prove to you that I'm good enough. Guess what? When you finally prove that you're good enough, for one, they're not even there. They don't care, even if they know. And then three, it's hollow. When you and get then there, four, if you do care, you've already lost. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> it's like one of those things like, why am I still a prison in their prison they don't even know about? Oh, right? that's brutal. Um, so, you know, it took me some time, right? I've had a couple of coaches, life coaches, mentors. Um, uh, I, I called out my wife's grandpa. He's no longer with us. He's up in heaven now. But uh, also Rick Barnett, I'll give him a shout out. I uh, met him when I was in Okinawa, Japan. So again, I joined Air Force in 2001. And I'm already describing things to you in 2012 you know, time frame. Uh, so it was a journey, right? I didn't just wake up one day and be like, I want to be a great dad. So I'm gonna, And then it started happening. And I'm not professing to be a great dad now. Uh, I think I've done the very best that I could. Or obviously, I've made mistakes and stuff. But uh, So there's something else about the dialogue. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, when you're telling them that is because, you know what? One day, they're going to be out of your, your care, right? They're going to be old enough or they're going to decide they just no longer want to be at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and if all you've said is, hey, that was a bad decision, um, they're going to know like some things are bad, but it's, animals can do the same thing, right? You can teach animals like how to, you know, make a decision like, hey, go poop outside as an example for a dog or a cat. Right. Or, uh, cats, not so much, but dogs. Dogs, right? Yeah. Um, so you can teach your child, uh, your child uh, how to, you know, certain decisions uh, lead to bad decisions, but they don't really know why. They just know that decision is bad. So as a dad or as a parent, of taking the time, right? Just like we do with airmen. I see, I see military members do it all the time. You know, NCOs, senior NCOs, <clears throat> sit down with their airmen, explain stuff to them, but then they won't do that at the house because they're expired, right? Time they get home, they're just like kind of done. So what I challenge all, all you know, uh, fathers or, or mothers, parents in general, uh, all especially ones that are in the military, uh, you got to make sure your home front. I had a friend, Chief uh, Frankie Moore, he's retired now, said you got to work EPR and a home EPR. Uh, oh so, my gosh. yeah, and he's like, hey, a lot of people that have those really good EPRs at work right. have a really bad one at home. Oh, and where wow. I'm going with that is, is when you sit down with your son or your daughter and you're like, hey, this, let's walk through that decision. You know, like, so not every time you have time for that, right? Because maybe it's a life and death or just one of those quick, like, hey, no, you're not going to eat any more cake, right? We'll talk about the decision on that later. Um, but, it's, but sometimes it's, you have the space. A lot of times we have the space to say, hey, walk me through how you arrived at this point. And we do that with uh, one of my sons uh, more so than the other. And, and I won't say too much because they might be listening to this and, and, and feel a certain way because <laughs> this is out, out in public. Uh, so definitely won't mention names. But a lot of times when you do that. Yeah, there are folks watching. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> somebody might listen to this. So I, I won't name drop on him. Yeah, don't yeah. name drop. We don't got a name no, drop. No, no, but they're uh, great, great young men. But when I start walking him through that, it gets really frustrating for him because he already knows. Like you already know. When he, don't sit, wanna, he don't want to nope. sit there and hear it again. No, nope. but he already knows. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got He's like, I know where dad's I'm about fair. to go with this. I'm, I was a stubborn young man. Uh, I will say I still am. I think that's a personality trait yeah. and, and it can be used for good or it can really get you in hot water. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that is who I am and, and that's how my daughter is too. I see it in her. That's why I have a fire inside yeah. on my arm. That's awesome. And my daughter has the fire inside and I know that and I know I need to 
you know, treat her a little, a different approach. Yeah. I have to, because I needed that different approach. Yeah. Can I share something else with you? Uh, a vulnerable moment for me. Um, like a lot of people might look on the outside and be like, <clears throat> uh, oh, you're, you're doing awesome as a dad and as an airman. Uh, and that's not true. Uh, there's, we're all human. We all screw things up or mess things up. You want a real test. If you're a father or I'm sorry, if you're a parent, uh, cause it could be father, mother. Um, if you're a parent and you want to know what your child thinks, and you're in the United States Air Force in our case, uh, go home and ask your child, uh, however old they are, what's the most important thing? Uh, so I heard uh, somebody challenged me with that. Okay. I was in a uh, Bible study, and uh, one of, a major that I was in there with uh, challenged me on that. I go home, I asked my boys, we had three at the time, um, and I said, hey, what's the most important thing to that? And just you can't, you can't caveat it with anything. You can't set parameters or bookends or whatever you want to call it on it. Just whatever comes out of their mouth, and you got to be ready for it. And I wasn't ready for it. Um, they're like the Air Force. The Air Force is the most important thing. So not even my faith, not not them, the Air Force. The Air Force was most important. That's how they perceived that. Right. was the most important thing. And I'm not telling people as a chief to, to go and not care about what you do in the Air Force. That's If you know me, you know that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, if you got a family, it has to be a priority. Uh, if you want to keep that family, you've heard it said before, and I'm sure your audience has heard it said, uh, and if they haven't, I'll, I'll explain it. Uh, the right row, the front right, who's on that row when you decide to retire, if that's what you're doing in the, in the Air Force, or if you're deciding to step out or separate or whatever, who is there in your in your fan box, right? Who's there in the club box that is cheering you on? Uh, sure, there's some military members, they'll high five you, you know, and say, hey, we love you and appreciate you. And maybe they even talk on social media a little while about you after you're gone or retired, uh, but that dies off after a while. And, and where's your family? Like, so if that, if that's important, that's one of your priorities. That was one of my priorities as a, as a man is faith, family, and service. And faith and family were not in the top two when the, my sons talked about like what was most important to dad, what they perceived, right? Right. So going back to that of what are you putting your time in? How are you harmonizing that? And so we're, I'm a work in progress, man. There's days I get it right, and there's days I get it really, really, really wrong. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to be. Uh, okay and vulnerable with ourselves not be afraid to look in the mirror and say hey you know what you got that wrong now go apologize for whatever that is and walk your children through your decision matrix right and not being feeling like you're above them and and saying like hey well they've always got to explain to me how they got to x y and z i do that with my sons i'm like hey we have a thing that i've raised my sons on that um it's kind of like an ojt plan if you're from the military and you can look at it and be like oh there's a spreadsheet with stuff marked on there and the reason i did that was to be deliberate about it uh, like teach them how to change a tire, how to grill hamburgers, how to do a campfire, how to survive mountain rescues, all this other stuff, you know. You put it in their 623As. You know, they had 797s because they were special. You know ah. what I mean? Ah. <laughs> so somebody <laughs> on the outside was like, what are they talking about now? We just went weird. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, we've, uh, you know, uh, love, courage, integrity, and discipline, right? Uh, the way it's written down is integrity, love, courage, and discipline. Those are the four main values I wanted to raise them with. They choose whatever values they want after that. So when we, either, any of us make a mistake, uh, when it's at that level, right? I mean, yeah, you didn't take out the trash because your mom told you to take out the trash. You're not going to get the four character uh, values um, conversation, but I'll come to them and I'll say, hey, look, when I raised my voice to you the other day or when I said the words that I said, that didn't line up with any of the values we've talked about. Here's where I failed you. Uh, can you forgive me? And some people might say, well, that's kind of sappy and crazy. But you know what? Uh, that's what we do in our family, right? I don't always do it. I don't always do it right. But there's got to be an intent and a, an intentionality about it, right? Just like uh, in the military, if you're, hey, I want this rank, or I want this award, I want this position, I want that job, whatever it is, uh, you got to be the same way with your family. I want to be the parent, uh, not necessarily that's on the billboard, right? Not saying you need to be a, be a billboard, pre, uh, you know, parent. But what are your kids saying about you when they aren't there? Like, if you were to interview my son, I wonder what he would say about his old man. You know what I mean? Like. Right. Uh, what have you, uh, you know, imprinted on them, those things that are good? Because uh, everybody has good in them somewhere. Are you imprinting those on your children? And at the end of the day, when all this is said and done, uh, so hopefully it won't offend anybody in your audience, but my wife said, uh, you know, when we talked about this as a family, me and her talked about it as a couple, about how we wanted to raise our sons. We said, uh, she's like, I want them to be good citizens, and I don't want them to be jackasses. You know what I mean? Like, I just want them to be good citizens. How do, how do we raise them to be good citizens, treat people with love and respect? Uh, so that's been the, the focus of, of our family nucleus, if you will. I love that. I love that you've written it out. Yep. And it's in your book, too. Um, I didn't realize I didn't know mine until I read that. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I really just hadn't really put any thought into it, like to the point of writing it down. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? 
like really forced to like sit down and write it down. And to be honest, I'm still kind of working through that. But you had you have two different categories, right? Uh, no. No, so just I got my values and then how I'll go about executing those values. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I like how you split that up. That that really helped me like understand it better. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm done writing mine out, I'll, I'll send it your way. It sounds good, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Maybe I could just like, we just throw a date out there right now. So you got to get it done. So you, you want to do it? Give me a date. Uh, let's see. 23rd October. That's my birthday. That's, that'd be your birthday gift to me. 23rd October. So on your birthday, I need to provide you a similar list. You do? Okay. For you? Yes. I mean, I will appreciate it, but it's for you. Yes. Okay. I'll remember that. And text that to me too, just so I, I can put it in my phone. But you know, I'm, at my age, as soon as I step off, I'm going to forget I told you that. And then later, I'm going to forget the date and think it's due now and be like, hey, bro, where's that? And, you're like, <laughs> and then I'm in trouble. You're like, I got time to do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked for an extension. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I want to hit another topic with you. First yeah. of all, thank you for being vulnerable. You're known for that. I mean, that's you. That's who you are. You share things, and you have a really special way of, of explaining it to where I think it really resonates with people, and that's something I super appreciate about you, always have. Okay. I always knew you were – you're built different. <laughs> Not just, can we – if you ever make another coin, it's called built different. Built different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that. Yes, please remember that. Um, you're not just physically built different. You're also like emotionally built different, right? And I think it, it has a lot to do with that trauma into treasure concept mm. that not everyone can get to. Most most don't. I didn't for a while. When I was in airman, I was drinking, had a heart virus, almost died, depressed, yeah. you know, no confidence whatsoever. So... Yes, I, I just really appreciate that that your journey and where you're at now and how you use it for good. Yeah, I, if I can, man, I know you got another topic, but I, I want to hit this real quick because I've heard it so many times. Okay, um, you know, people like uh, where they're from, how they were raised, whatever their circumstance. That's just how I am, right? Um, I'm, I'm all about people being their true, authentic self. But where there's a line, and not to get into, <clears throat> I'm not a doctor by any means, but. I think so many times, and I've learned this from my experience and I've, just what I've seen. I'm not saying this, I'm not generalizing this, I'm not saying this is for everyone, right? Because mm -hmm. every situation is different. But so many times people use their circumstances as a crutch to be what is easier to be. It's easy, I'll be honest with you, when I was younger, to be a violent, angry person made me very effective on the football field. And I used that. I used my hatred for my father to power me, right? Mm -hmm. I know it sounds weird and some people are like, man, what did I just tune into? Mm -hmm. But it's like almost like a superpower. When, when you don't care about anybody around you and you only care about yours, you, you are very effective at a lot of things. But people use that as a crutch. It takes courage uh, and a lot of discipline to make a decision to say, hey, the circumstances gave me an opportunity to make a decision to be different. That's a lot of part. That's the part that a lot of people miss is personal responsibility within that decision space. Uh, again, now I'm not saying I needed, I needed assistance. I needed counseling. I needed a lot of things to get me to that point. Uh, so I'm not saying that you can just wake up and be like, hey, this happened to me. My parents were taken from me. I was abused or whatever the case may be and say, I'm going to make a decision to be better. That's not what I'm saying to people. I'm just saying, get the help that you need, pause, accept responsibility for your decisions from that point moving forward. I got family members that never did that. And they want to blame everything on everybody else. You wow. know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's like, well, that's just the way I was raised. I didn't get a good fair shake at life. There's a lot of people that didn't get a fair shake at life. What are you going to do about it? Uh, so anyway, I don't want to go too far down that road. I just wanted to make that plug that, you know, people out there, there might be somebody that needs to hear that of saying, you know what, maybe there's a point, maybe that old dude's got a point, you know? So Right. No, you do. And and actually, you, you brought up something else I want to ask you about. So I actually have two things I want to ask you about. I'm just trying to sort it out in my head here. Yeah. But here's a topic I wanted to talk about for a while, and I feel like you're a good person to bounce it off of. It's what I call using the dark side of the force. Okay. Let's talk, explain before I start jumping on that one. <laughs> so exactly what you said. So there's where Chief Faden's career went downhill real fast. Yes. <laughs> and they never saw him again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, using the dark side of the force is what I call it. It's a Star Wars reference. Okay. I like Star Wars. Uh, and using the dark side of the force is, is it beneficial to use anger and frustration to reach a goal oh. by using the dark side of the force to get there? Or do you think that will always fail in the end? So I think uh, it's funny you asked that because that's essentially what I was, uh, what I just alluded to. That's why you reminded it. me of it. Um, so it's, uh, is it a, a good idea? No. Is it effective? 100. 
right? It's effective. Have you ever used it in your career? 100%. Like when I first came in the military, they thought, they referred to me as corporal They because I act like I was a Marine. What? Uh, so I used the F word very efficiently and proficiently. The knife hand, I didn't care about your feelings. Like they called me uh, the corporal bulldog, right? If they wanted something fixed or there was a hard topic or a hard person to deal with, just let Vader handle it, you know, because I didn't care about your feelings at all. Uh, I'm not proud of that at all. I'm not, uh, it's something I'm ashamed of. And it, there's, you don't have time on this one, one podcast. Uh, it's in my book about, you know, like, uh, when you make the wrong decisions, uh, and when you don't get to know people and you don't value people, there's a whole, a whole st group of stories about that where I learned all that. But, uh, yeah, so it's very effective. Uh, like I said before, it's kind of like a superpower. When I was on the football field, my objective was to try to hurt you. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't even care if I stopped the play. I just wanted to hurt you. And then only a couple of games in, people start understanding that, and they're like, this dude's dangerous, right? Not Because they don't care if they win the game. They just want to hurt you. So then after a while, people don't come to your side of the field, right? right. So over time, you apply that to your life, your career. Uh, so is it effective? Yes, to a certain point. And then guess what? You're going to top out. Uh, in the Air Force today, that those types of behaviors are, are weeded out really quickly. And in my situation, I had supervisors that took advantage of that. Uh, that were no. like, they were like, hey, this dude's going to go get the, the hard stuff done because he just don't care. Uh, he's going to work to the bone, his fingers to the bone, right? So they just kind of like. Then that's even more of a Star Wars reference because yeah. that's how uh, Darth Sidious takes advantage of Darth Vader. Yeah. Whoa. So that's wild. So you always pay the price, right? You're always going to pay the price. And then what I paid the price was relationships, right? That I had damaged people's lives that I had adversely affected or negatively impacted. Uh, so. What I challenge everybody is when you have that feeling like uh, nobody else matters, there's a lot of stuff from I have found over the, my time in the Air Force, 21 years in, everybody, everyone I've ever come across has psychological or emotional damage. They, they do. It's just, that's life. Uh, now, I'm not saying that's for everybody. Some people out there probably don't have it. I've never met them. Uh, maybe it's just the people that are drawn to me that I'm drawn to that I feel similarities like, hey, they've just had a harder walk in life or, or whatever it is. Uh, but people definitely have, I call it prayers, you know, being psychologically ready and emotionally steady, you know, and to get to that point, you have to deal with the stuff in the past. So you're going to, if you go through life and just try and throw anger at it uh, and anger is what motivates you, the lack of caring about people motivates you to get things done. It makes it easier if you can make those hard decisions, if you will, um, you're going to pay for it because you're, you're going to pay for it through other people's lives. Uh, so I'd ask anybody that's going through that right now, that's sitting there thinking about that or analyzing and having some introspection saying, man, you know what? I think I am a little bit like that. If you could just peel the, the onion back a little bit, look over, like what are people actually doing right now that you had effect on, right? What is their life? Did their life get better because they knew you? Did you add value to their life? Did you improve or enhance their life? Chances are you didn't, especially if you're acting on anger and malice and hatred, right? Uh, you didn't make their life any better. Uh, so is it effective in some cases? Yes. Uh, uh, but is it a, a uh, or is it efficient? Yeah, but it's, you're always going to pay the price on it. So no, don't go to the dark side, bro. No dark side of the no force. No dark side, no. So I tapped into the dark side of the force one time. Yeah. And it was to make tech sergeant my first time. Mm. And what was, uh, so I retrained into public health and I was like real insecure. I thought retraining would solve like all my problems, but being a staff, a new staff sergeant or relatively new in an environment where I wasn't familiar with the career field of public health, um, I, I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know how to s ask for help. Mm, I really yeah. needed help bad. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wasn't getting it and I didn't know how to ask for it. And um, there's a few individuals in there who I felt were disrespectful and taking advantage of the fact that I didn't know certain things. And I got it in my head that if I made tech sergeant my first time, then they couldn't keep disrespecting me like mm. that. Mm. And guess what? I did make tech sergeant my first time. Out of pure anger and frustration, I did make it my first time. Do you think they stopped disrespecting me? No, not at all. It got worse. Yeah. Not only did it get worse, but now my insecurity had grown even larger mm -hmm. because now I'm, you know, one of them I'm the same rank as now and one of them I outrank. And that's where I kind of also learned a lot about personal power and how that can sometimes influence even more than the rank. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, oh my goodness, you want to talk about not a good situation. That's, that's, that's the first time I actually, you know, during a confrontation lost it and was basically going toe to toe with someone. And I got a lot of trouble for that, Yeah. but it's because I, I handled it with 
negativity. Mm. I didn't handle it with tools or asking for help. I handled it with, I could do this on my own and out of pure anger and frustration. And it, none of that ever ends well. And it didn't for me in that, in that situation. You know, uh, some of it, I don't know if it was for you or not, um, potentially. Uh, a lot of times with uh, the situation I've been involved in is pride's at, at stake too. Um, because a lot of times, I know I've experienced it myself when I've been in the heat of the moment, I know, like I know I'm starting to step over the line and I know I'm like, all right, well, I could just back off. What's everybody else going to say that knows about it, right? Or, well, if I'm going to tell this story, then I got to be the, you know, the Billy, you know what, the badass of the story kind of thing, right? Uh, the hero of the story. Um, there's a villain in every story. Uh, most of the time, we're the villain of that story and we just fail to realize that. I read this book one time called Crucial Conversations and it kind of, we paint a story in our head. You paint it like if so I paint a story in my head, you paint a story in your head of the situation that's in front of us. The situation in front of us has zero emotion. It has the truth. So it has its own story of truth, right? And we don't see it, right? Um, and a lot of times we get up to that point if we just put our pride in our cargo pocket. You know, we got issued you know, uniforms with cargo pockets for a reason. It's supposed to be a, our core values going there when we leave basic. And sometimes people leave them open, they fall, the core values fall out. But it's another reason you can slide pride in your pocket too. Uh, and just take a step back and be like, all right, how should I handle this situation? Somebody might think I'm a fill in the blank, whatever that is, right? A, a weak person or whatever. Uh, but that's the road that is a lot less traveled, but it's the most effective. When you get to those situations and you're like, you know what? Let me just, let me stop for a second. Why am I acting this way? Is it pride that's motivating me at this point? Because there's a chance that what they're saying could be partially right. What I'm saying is partially right. Where's the truth and all that? We're never going to find the truth attacking it with a dark force. So I'm glad that, uh, to hear that you learned uh, from, from utilizing the dark force. You had one situation. I had years of the dark force, bro. So uh, I can tell you it's, it's not good. Oh, you want to talk about a rude awakening when I put, I wear tech sergeant and the, the disrespect goes up a notch. <laughs> that was a rude awakening. Yeah. That was a rude awakening. Oh my gosh. I'll never forget that. Um, learned a lot of lessons at that assignment made a lot of mistakes and lost a lot of opportunities. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, I left that base not keeping in touch with really in my immediate work center. No one. Oh, wow. You leave your base with no contacts. It didn't end well. No, not at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I did have friends on the base, but out of like public health, like where I was at. Yeah. I left empty handed mm. and I had, so I had to learn some really hard lessons there. So I made a lot of mistakes and I hope to God I don't run into them. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> or I'm going to say sorry. Oh, I just you... got to tell them sorry. And sometimes, man, I don't know if it's for you. Um, I had to go make amends. That that was for me, right? I yeah. had to, because I see uh, at the end of the day, wherever I'm at, right? Um, right. I'm in my comfort place. I'm, I'm in my rocking chair. Sipping on some sweet tea because I ain't worried about the PT test anymore, you know, because sugar, you know, probably ain't that good for you. Uh, I got my sweet tea and I can just imagine everybody I've served with. And I've got an answer to each one of them, right? Like uh, somebody says, hey, Caleb, Caleb did it right. And if anybody in the crowd says bull crap, he did me wrong and they're justified. And what I mean by that is that I never went back to him and apologized for whatever action that I took or didn't take, whatever the case may be. Uh, then I did it wrong. I failed everything. And, and from a career standpoint, from a life standpoint, because I wasn't an example for my sons. And some people are like, man, that's a really hard, high standard. That's the standard I give myself. That's not the standard for everybody else. That's the standard for me. So that drives me to go and say, you know what? I want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to be a positive influence. I mean, that's that's my, my why statement, if you will. Create a remarkable experience so I can improve and add value to other people's lives. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about for me. Right. So I need to be able to be big enough, if you will, to go back and say, hey, man, Josh, I, I messed this one up, man. Remember that one time where I said this or I did this or I did that or didn't do this when I said I was? That was wrong, man. I, I have to ask you if you can try to forgive me. If you can, you can. If you can't, at least I've done what I can with that situation, right? So to your point, if you ever run across them, yeah, apologize, man. Yeah, it's going to make you feel a lot better. No, I would. Yeah, I, I certainly would if I do run into them again, 100%. I, I, for a long time, I wasn't in that headspace. Yeah. And, you know, forget that. I don't need that. But then eventually, you're like, oh, crap. Like, yeah. I probably should say something, you know. So that, that's kind of where I'm at now in my yeah. life. Um, okay, so you ready for this last topic? Let's get it. The last topic is adversity. I don't know. I feel like we both had adversity. And I'll tell you why. Because we put ourselves out there. <laughs> and so if you don't put yourself out there, you might not get a lot of joy and you might not 
get a lot of connections, but you also won't have adversity because you're staying within your in your lane and in your bounds, and a lot of people roll that way. Yep. Um, but if you are one that wants to get out there, be heard, be seen, and help others, you are leaving yourself open for criticism, mm -hmm. period, dot. Yeah. Every time we turn this on, every single time, it doesn't matter what our intention is, it does not matter, we are taking a risk at people you know, having negative feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a ton of it, especially out the gate with this. People are telling me I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't talk to that person or this person. There's a lot of adversity. Yeah. Obviously, we've come a long way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're at AFSA now, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm at AFSA. I got that, that stamp of, hey, you're on the right track. And I love that. I'm so blessed for that. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm so happy I hung in there. Yeah, yeah. I, almost, I can't tell you how many times I almost quit. I, I, at least 10 times, yeah. I've almost quit for different reasons. You know what I mean? Um, it, and I learned a lot about myself in this process mm -hmm. too. You know, a lot about myself. Uh, and I've come a long way myself in hearing your guys' stories. And it's been just so amazing. But I, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I am, because of my childhood... I am not good with adversity. Mm. I'm not. It triggers me. Yeah. And I and I you know after talking with therapists, it's because of my childhood and and my perception of attention and you know positive or negative that has shaped me into someone who struggles with rejection and negative mm. feedback. Mm -hmm. And and so that's powerful for me to know that. Yeah. Right, so that I can reel it in and not get triggered and set off. Yeah, yeah. But looking at my pet, like growing up and coming through the ranks, your boy gets triggered. <laughs> <laughs> like those people that were disrespecting me. Yeah, yeah. You know, the me now, I could probably just be like, okay. Yeah. I've come a long way, so I could probably let that roll off my back, but back then I couldn't let it stand. Mm -hmm. I had to have that confrontation. I couldn't, it was eating me up inside. Yeah. It was almost like I'd lost control. And had to face them head on it at some point. Yeah. It was coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I lost control. It wasn't there. I didn't mm -hmm. have that, you know, uh, that barrier there to reel it in. Um, and so I don't deal with adversity well, which is surprising because I put myself out there on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I am working on it and I am aware of it. But, you know, someone like you, I know you've had adversity as well. And I was just hoping I could get your take as the last part of our talk here on adversity how you've handled it and you know some tools for me oh yeah so uh another great question thanks for asking um i've been there's lots of different levels of adversity right um there's there's deployment adversity there's life adversity there's loss of life which has its own separate categories for me and it doesn't mean i have different values on that it's just uh, you know, family member, uh, brothers serving in arms with it. So there's, there's, you know, distant family members, close family members. So anyway, there's a lot of different buckets of adversity, if you will, that are in my head. Um, I know some doctor is going to be listening to this someday and be like, that poor guy needs some help somewhere. Uh, and we all do, that's for sure. But, they're already, um, they're already talking on here. Yeah, yeah. They, they probably are. Yeah. They're um, trying to schedule you. No, <laughs> hey, well, yeah, I give them plenty of business, I'm sure. Um, but, but yeah, so there's adversity. It depends on like what it is and what the situation is, is where I was going with that is, you know, if, if there's an adversity of loss of life, uh, that and I'm going to go to a funeral of a family member or to to a brother that's fallen. Right, uh, I already know what that feels like. So I go and I know I'm a different creature. I will go to that place where a sadness existed or it does exist, darkness exists, and I'm going to pull that back into the forefront, if you will, and and focus on it. Like, how did I get through this? Remembering how the for me the verses that I went through, my Bible verses I went through, the conversations I had. I need to feel those feelings again of despair a little bit. So I know like, okay, that's, that's the threshold. Remember what that feels like. Uh, so that's how I pull on adversity. Now I don't go looking for it. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, when I, when I, you say we put ourselves out there for, you know, the uh, potential for adversity, I don't go looking for it, but I'm also not afraid of it. Right. Because I know I've made it through a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, I really believe that my purpose on earth isn't fulfilled yet. Uh, when it is, then I'll no longer be here. Uh, and I'm doing what I love doing, whether that's in my, my personal space as, as a chief. I'm getting to be a chief in the Air Force is one of the coolest things ever, right? It um, is. So there's a lot of things I've gone through up to this point in my life as a human, as a man, as a father, as a husband, as an airman. Uh, so I just use that as power fuel, if you will. Not power in the sense of power, but power that fuels an in engine or a machine, right? All the things that I've been through, I draw on those to face whatever's in front of me. That doesn't mean it's easy. 
dude, sometimes it sucks, right? As, 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 a, as a person that sits in front of you, there's things that I've gone through in the recent that I'm like, I don't like this. This sucks, right? It's like getting, you know, like if you're on fire and getting put out with a wet chain. Like this is not the way to extinguish this fire. Why do we have to do it this way? Um, but just in that moment of, you know, like if you've ever been in a firefight or anything like that, you start doing the techniques that work for you. For me, it's box breathing and, and focusing with finger tap and, and slowing everything down and saying, okay, I've been here before. I know what this is about. I know how to get through this. Or even something you hadn't been through exactly the same thing, pulling from those things that you have been through, just like anything else that you would in life. You're, in, you're driving on a wet road. I've done this before. I know I need to slow down, watch out for you know darker spots. It might be puddles. It calls me to hydroplane. Same thing with adversity, man. You're going you're gonna to be rejected at some point in time. Uh, <laughs> if you're me, a lot. Uh, there's sometimes that people are going to approve you and love you, right? There's going to be times where it works out for you. You get the promotion or whatever, whatever that is that you're looking for. A lot of times you're not. Understanding you can't control timing or the opportunity. Only what you do within the time and the opportunity you've been given. Personal accountability and responsibility. I think of that every time I'm in adversity. What am I doing wrong? I can dislike you. Could We could be in the situation and I'm just, it's easy to blame you for it. But going back to what I said earlier about owning our own responsibility, like, okay, what am I doing in this situation that's making it worse or making it better? Um, being psychologically ready and emotionally steady. I know I'm pulling a lot of stuff back out from what we were talking about, but that's that's where my heart is on it. So I need to be psychologically ready. How do I do that? Uh, you know, I was talking to, to another one of your guests that was on here earlier about spiritual readiness, and that's what works for me. That's my life. Uh, of I need to go and say, okay, what? this is my why. This is my purpose. I mentioned earlier, this is what's powering me. If I don't achieve my purpose and my goal, I've got to answer for that, right? So in adversity, I'm thinking those same things, pulling back the stuff that has worked in the past, but what's my purpose in life? What is at the end of the day, guess what? I'm going to have to take this off one day. You are too, right? We all do it at some point in time, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is. We take this off and then who's underneath here? All the stuff that we've gone through in life, all that stuff, are, are we a person? Are, are we still, if we take this off and we just fall apart? No, some people do. That's Definitely. all they have. That's all they have in life is this uniform. I love this fabric for our nation. I love serving our nation. I love the Air Force. I love her airmen. But at the end of the day, I'm going to take this off and I've got to answer for all the things that I've done, right? Uh, and, and I want to be able to go through life and say, hey, you know what? I did the best I could with what I had when I had it, right? I took advantage of the time and the opportunities given to me. Yeah, there were some things that sucked, right? There's some adversity got thrown your way. Uh, and you can sit there and just spin in that adversity cycle, right? You can stay in the cycle. or But what we said earlier is make a decision to say, you know what, I'm going to exit. You ever seen those diagrams like the donut diagram where you got an entry point, kind of like a loop? Some people just get stuck on the loop and forget there's an exit point. But you got to make the decision to get out. I don't know if that necessarily helps you with uh, adversity piece, right, of going through adversity. Um I think if you're seeking out something you know is going to cause you adversity, that you know, allows you to put yourself in a little bit better space, headspace, because you know it's coming, right? And you're like trying to navigate it before. Sometimes you just get hit out of left field. I will also tell you this too, man. Uh, some of us have a, um, I really believe this, a different walk in life uh, where, you know, we're visionary and the visionaries aren't always appreciated. It's like a door kicker on an entry team, right? Nobody wants to be the door kicker, but somebody got to be the door kicker. Somebody's got to knock the door down. They're usually the first person engaged, right, in a firefight. Uh, if you're going into a, an, an enclosure, right, somebody's got to do it. So that's why I, I kind of take that as a mantle, right? Somebody's got to go speak for the airman. Somebody's got to take care of that family of mine, right? So that's my job. That's my job to go speak for the airman as a chief mass sergeant. Some people are going to dislike what I have to say, but I got to also know, hey, is it what's it based on? What's it founded on? So sometimes you go out and you say that, and all of a sudden adversity is in your face. And those are the ones that are a little bit shocking, a little bit catch you off guard. Uh, so don't know if that helps you. Don't know if it answers your question. Happy to try to try to re-answer if that doesn't help you out, man. No, I think you gave a bunch of amazing tools there, um, especially like the part where recognizing the loop, yeah. you know, recognizing those feelings. The situation might be different, but the feeling and the reaction is familiar. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and then just recognizing that and finding your way to like dial that down. Yeah. No, I love that. And I'll tell you one thing that I've done lately that's helped is put my care, love and energy into the people I care and love about, you yeah. know? So like, instead of putting all my energy into something that I'm worried about, you know, understanding that I can't control everything mm -hmm. And then redirecting that energy and turning it into love and focusing on those people and those relationships. Yeah. That that has helped me tremendously leaning into that. Yeah, and I found that time fixes a lot of things or helps doesn't fix helps with a lot of things after time. You know, just strategic patience and a pause. 
a lot of things blow over, right? I saw this study one time, I don't remember the exact percentages, but I think out of 100% of the worry, right, only 8% of it actually ever comes true. Wow. Uh, you know, and I, I have it written down somewhere. I don't have it on me right now, but when I read that, I read it in a book. I just don't remember. I was like, my goodness, that's an interesting stat. Like, I don't know how that's, a, it's probably not 100% true, right? But 8%, I say, let's say 10%, 10% of what you worry about actually happens. That's a good day, you know? Right. When you actually look back on your life, you're like, that thing I was worried about there, that thing I was worried about there, that person I was worried about, it never actually happened, right? Sometimes we get stuck in the loop and we like we actually make things happen yeah. by our actions because we're so antsy about it or so paranoid about it. The other point I had on that where I was going is when you take this off, at the end of the day, if, it, if I fail at work, right? If I fail in my career, uh, my son still loves me and my wife still loves me. If I've, if I've managed those relationships and I've poured into those relationships like I should, uh, and for me as a person of faith, if that for some reason is gone, then then I still have God that I love, right? So uh, for me, uh, I'm not. I'm, I know that's not for everybody. For me, that's that's my life. Um, so I think that gives me an extra. Uh, when you're going through adversity, you're like, oh, it's, oh, it's we'll get through this. And you know what? Even if we don't get through this, this ain't the end of me, right? Um, right. So many so many people have success built in their mind. Sorry, I'm writing, a, I'm writing a book out loud for you, I guess. But so many people have success in their mind on these things that aren't, honestly, they're not success. This, these stripes, I love them, but that doesn't define me, right? I love the, the, the idea of the opportunities I have with them is what I mean, what I'm trying to say. But you know what? Guess what? These don't define me. The uniform doesn't define me. Uh, so, so many people have these things built in their mind that success is. And then when they're in that adversity, they're like, they see all that crumbling. Because they're like, man, I'm, I'm going to get fired from this position. I'm not going to have a chance for rank. I'm not, whatever it is, right? I'm not going to get the stratification. Whatever it is, they see their success start crumbling because their success is honestly, and I know this is harsh. It sounds bad. It sounds hard. I mean, it's built on the wrong things, right? Um, but you can't always, you don't know that, right? You only know what you know. Um, but now you know. So if you listen, now you know. <laughs> and that's real talk. Real talk. Boom. <laughs> Isn't like that awesome? Sound yeah. yeah. What's this other button do? Go ahead. Try it. What's it do? <laughs> I don't know why it's 70s music. I don't know why. Turn it on. You just started it again. Yeah. Okay, let's try this one. That's the crowd. Cheer yeah. them on. Let's go. <laughs> and then when you hit them with that dad joke. There you go. Right there. I love it. Yeah. And I can do a good radio voice since I've been talking yeah. all day. <laughs> I didn't know I had that radio voice. It's actually pretty fun. I'm not going to lie. I've yeah. been having a blast with that. It, I was so good at it during the music that someone I was interviewing thought that that was the box. Oh, yeah? They were like, you're making that voice? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, it's an aside gig. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm, about to, I'm fixing to get hired out here yeah. for like monster trucks or something. There I don't you know. Go. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, well, hey, we hit all the topics. These are awesome. all the things on my mind that I wanted to talk to you about that I've been thinking about for a long time, if I'm being honest with you. Um, and I knew a little bit about it, but not the whole story. Yeah. And so I was able to really, truly hear your thoughts. And I got to say, you're an incredible person. Thank you, man. You are. And, and I know we're all not perfect. No, I know I that. I'm definitely not. Right. But I, I love your views on life, your mindset, your values, how you exercise your values how you've turned trauma into treasure, how you love your wife so much, how you love being a chief for all the reasons of helping others. I heard a lot of chiefs say, these aren't my stripes, they're yours. Yep. I've heard a lot of them, at least two or three of them have said that to me yep. just in the past few days. And I love that. I, and I love that someone at your level has that kind of love in their heart for people because that yep. sets the tone for the whole thing. You got something that's not right up here, they're oh, yeah. going to put pressure on them. They're going to treat them like crap and it's going to go all the way down. But if you hit it with, with love and respect and kindness, like the way you do, then I, I know we're in good hands. So I just want to tell you, thank you for appreciate being it. you. Thank you for putting yourself out there to better us. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that, man. Yes. I love it. Um, final thoughts. Do you have any? Uh, well, that's dangerous, man. How long we've been on? Here? We've been on here for an hour and Four minutes. Yeah, we're probably killing people's brain cells right now. Like, man, they got to be quiet. I, I will leave you with just one thing. One thing. All right, let's uh, hit it. One thing that's probably 30 minutes long. No, it won't be that bad. <laughs> we're sitting down at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more energy <laughs> drink is needed. Yeah. Uh, no, but on a serious, uh, thanks uh, Thanks for what you do. I know you, you gave me some words, man. I appreciate it. But thanks for what you do. Um, you have faced some adversity with this platform, right? And uh, you stuck with it. And it's important because... Um, there might be lessons to learn from that, sure, from a, from a Josh perspective, but if we're going wider than that or larger, more broad than that, 
airmen need it, right? I remember when you first reached out to me and you were talking about doing it. And you're like, hey, airmen have a lot of stories out there. And I thought, I, I don't remember the exact words I told you. I remember what's in my heart right now, what I, what I felt. Uh, was man, we need people that are that are talking to airmen, right? And that's all grades of airmen, right? Uh, I hear people saying this; they don't mean anything by it. They're like big A airmen. We're all big A airmen, right? So right. there's no need to say that anymore. We're just airmen, right? Right. Uh, not I shouldn't say just airmen, but we are airmen. So no need to qualify it or quantify it. Uh, so thanks for what you do for getting the messages out because people you have on, like I'm thinking about a Mike Rosa right now, right? Yes. Of the adversity when we talk about adversity, I'm thinking yes. about the people you've had on. Do you have, you probably do know, but maybe you don't know the full impact that that's having, not just you, but you creating a space for people to share their story and how it's helping other people. So it's phenomenal. Uh, and I just wanted to leave a word of encouragement for anybody that's this listener or hears this. Uh, you're going to go through the stink or the suck or whatever you want to call it. It's going to happen. That's life. Life is going to happen. Uh, make sure you're surrounding yourself with that circle, building that circle of those, those people that you know you can go to. Uh, that you can confide in because that's so vitally important. If you don't have that, this world's a cruel place. And if you don't have that circle, that's how a lot of our airmen stumble. That's how a lot of our humans in society stumble. When I say stumble, end up falling into despair uh, and depression. And, and unfortunately, some people take their own lives. Uh, and so you can you can cut that off at the gap, so to speak, by creating that circle. Make sure you're spending time with those people that are important. If you're out there and you're saying family is important, by my goodness, you better spend some time with your family, right? If your airmen are important, don't just say it. Make sure that your airmen know that they're important, right? That goes to knowing their story, knowing their values, what teaching them what how to find their values, if that's the case, right? Teach them how to find their why, their purpose, right? Uh, so I just want to encourage people, like, yeah, you're going to go through some stuff. Build yourself a strong circle. You can always reach out to me, throw my contact stuff on there on the social side or whatever, but uh, so people can always reach out to me. Uh, but just keep your keep your eye on the objective. If you have your values and your why, your purpose, it's a lot easier to get through those things that are very, very difficult where people really, really struggle when they either one, don't have that circle or they don't have their purpose. They don't know what they're on earth for. Those dark times, those things of adversity seem like insurmountable. If you have a circle, you have that purpose. It's just something that hits you in the face and you can keep moving, right? Uh, we overuse the word resiliency, I think, in the Air Force a lot. Everything gets a, a resiliency. Um, and I love what we do in the Air Force. I'm just saying a lot of times leaders at the human level overuse that. Uh, so don't overuse that word. You actually have to do it. You have to have to build resiliency. Build resiliency in yourself and then show others how to do that, right? And it's different for everybody. For me, it's physical activities. It might not be that for you. Find out what it is for that other person to help them through their journey in life. And quit using mentorship on all the EPRs and OPRs. Man. You know, don't get me on the paper tigers. Like If we are actually mentored as much as we say we do, me and you aren't even having this conversation because it's all like everybody already knows about it, right? I remember that talk, right? uh, that episode you did. <laughs> paper tiger. Managing the my paper football. tigers. That, one, that episode <laughs> blew my mind. I was like... This is this is gold. This yep. is this is go I've never heard a putt like that, yep. quite like that. That was really yep. uh, you just killed it on that one. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I don't know about that, but I just had to speak my mind. So yeah, just uh, just I want people to uh, to look around them and appreciate what they have. Right? We're all blessed in this nation. If you're listening to this in the United States, uh, we're all really really blessed. Uh, so be thankful, have an attitude of gratitude, right? Uh, and then just share that love. Share love with people, right? It's not, not trying to use an old Black IP song or anything, but because, uh, you know, that's copyright and whatnot. But, you know, it's one of those things, just show each other. Uh, you got to love yourself, right? And have that self-discipline, all those things we talked about. But just extend it to one person. Just start with one person and you'll see the payback, right? And the payback is them benefiting from it, right? And you're adding value. And then it's contagious. You'll continue to do that. And you're building other coaching trees, as Joe Bogdan says. So anyway, that's a lot for closing comments. Yes, that I was great. I feel like great. I got way too much in my head. I got to get out, man. You got it out. <laughs> I think you got it. We got out about one-tenth of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Hey, I just wanted to thank anyone. There was a lot of folks that were watching at some point. I see a lot of names in here uh, of people who did tune in. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I want to thank our guest again, Chief Caleb Vaden for spending time with us, for mentoring us, for putting yourself out there yet again, but on the Hero Front podcast. Heck yeah. And we're, I'm going to share this file with you. Awesome, bro. And it's going on Real Talk with Caleb. I, I can't even sound that cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you all later. Out.